just is like random. Hey, random what's countdowns. Up? Good morning, mediums. Welcome to another oh. episode of Live. It's season two, episode 73. I am Josh Hayes here, as always, with my co hosts, Scott Moon and Chuck Manley. Today, the best selling author of the Arisen series, Michael Stephen Fuchs, joins the show. Uh, his Perfect. friend Josh, and. Josh, good job. Excellent to me. High five. Uh, his friend and returning guest, best-selling author Devin C. Ford, convinced him to check us out. So today we've got a special two-guester episode. Uh, Michael has been writing and publishing since uh, around 2005, and today he joins us to talk about his writing journey. Michael, Devin, welcome back to the show. Hi, hey guys. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, it's always fun when we have a returning guest because then the pre-show goes the way our always pre-show goes where there's a lot of cursing and shenanigans and nobody knows what's going on. Complete chaos. Um, uh, I don't know how we started talking about spiders on the pre-show. I don't. I, <laughs> I hate spiders. Absolutely don't like them. You'll never see a spider on the show at all. Uh, if somebody has a book that has Dude, Are you looking at your screen because there's a spider right house. behind you? I don't know why you guys have to be mean. Like that. I think I really there's a spider don't. on your bookshelf. I can see <laughs> not, it moving. It's crawling. Spider. I'm not even looking back there. Yeah, right? you should look. You should look. I made it's you look. one of those bobblehead things, I think, isn't it? Mm -hmm. A spider all bobblehead. They're all going in the trash after the show. <laughs> <laughs> it started because you were talking about burning houses down. Oh, that's right. Right, yes. right, right. That's right. So we should quickly well i don't know do you want can you talk about how you get rid of sweating dynamite well, is that you, appropriate for the podcast okay. so we is that started about, spider for, we, and then we're going yes. to spiders because that's so logical. we were talking about burning dynamite because sweating dynamite's hard to move you, it's impossible to move really so you just burn it down where it's at well if you find dynamite in a house then you got to tell the people we're going to burn down your house so you call the insurance company, you tell them you're going to burn down the house and then you burn down the house they're quiet destroying the dynamite and devin being the off, awesome uh, guess that he is as well. Co coincidentally, that's how I get rid of spiders as well as burning down the house. And, <laughs> and it went on a whole big thing about huntsman spiders killing camel spiders and Dracula vampire spiders. I don't know yeah. where it all came from. Chaos, but. everybody <laughs> fleeing, Josh sleeping upstairs because of his uh, <laughs> trauma from watching arachnophobia, arachnophobia against his nice. parents' wishes because you know that was a smart decision. We really need to figure out a way to record that stuff. And then and then it's a twofer. Then the get the the everybody that watches the show can see that the, the ridiculous ridiculous randomness that happens prior to the show and mm -hmm. then we could bribe the guest and say uh unless you pay us a million dollars we're gonna air this and uh <laughs> then we never do a show again right yeah. Yeah. and then it's all over. <laughs> and then you gotta burn it down with the huntsman spider right uh so getting getting the show on track today uh Michael, you've written a, and co-written a series, looks like a risen, uh, but you mentioned right during the pre-show pre that uh, you're also traditionally published. That's how you started out. So uh, for people that don't know anything about you, would you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in uh, writing? Yeah, sure. Um, well, um, I started writing in uh, 95, actually. 2005 was when something actually got published. So it's a bit of a long, sad road. But uh, my first um, novel, which I started in the 90s, was picked up a decade later by Macmillan in the UK. And um, they published my second novel, ultimately to their great cost. And um, then there's a bit of an interregnum in there where I had an agent chopping stuff around. And then the entire industry changed overnight, of course, the whole independent publishing revolution. And uh, I was able to surf onto that. And uh, I've had the very pleasant experience of making a living as a jobbing fiction writer sensation and um so i've been writing this um principally writing this one very long epic special operations military zombie apocalypse series um for about the last five and a half years and i just finished it and now i get my life back which is very cool. <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> congratulations on that do you have a military background no i do not have the honor of having served um i have a lot of friends who've served and family as well but then a lot of people um in and out of the military a few in the special operations community. And in particular, uh, a pretty significant number I've been really lucky enough to hear from through the books. Um, they get in touch, and it's such a privilege and such an honor. It's really the best part of this job, and I've developed not just some acquaintanceships, but some friendships with top guys, and so that's a real honor and um, a great thing. Uh you know, we, we mentioned in your in your intro that uh, originally you started out uh, oh, traditionally. Trees? traditionally published and uh then there was kind of a long gap and then uh indie publishing kind of took off and i think that's uh, the the avenue a lot of successful uh authorpreneurs have taken recently but uh can you tell us a little bit about your your traditional experience and and what that book was and um 
kind of what what led you to transition to indie? Yeah, I think the watchwords are wild disappointment. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I had it pretty good. But, you know, I was I was incredibly lucky, and even in the depths of like thinking, okay, this is what I've been dreaming of my whole life, and it actually kind of sucks. Even in the depths of that, I was aware of how fortunate I was. But you go, you know, through life thinking that if you could just get published, everything will be okay, and then of course you get published, and everything's not okay. And, you know, my first novel did pretty well by the modest standards of first novels, and then the second novel did much less well. And so that was sort of the end of it. You know, you don't get a third chance these days. And, um, you know, they were, um, the, there was one guy who was a board level director of Macmillan, and he had this idea for this imprint for new writers. And so it was a great ride. It was fun, you know, and you did all, you did the readings, you did the signings, all the traditional stuff. You didn't, in the end, sell a ton of books. I can realize that, you know, you're not. I had friends who thought I must be rich because I was on a recognizable imprint, and that was a joke, you know. <laughs> right. Um, so I got a is that, is that book series still available out there? Yeah, yeah. They're um, you know, I get a tiny little royalty check every six months from the <laughs> <laughs> Although ironically, I'm driving readers to my earlier books just through the later books, which are a lot more popular. Um, thank goodness. Yeah. Let's talk about your newer series. Uh Devin before you joined was saying that uh he's uh listening to him on the uh, audio book and is really enjoying that and and that uh, actually you were the one who convinced him to go with rc bray to to perform for his books oh yeah well uh, you don't want to tell anybody what to do so i was trying to find a way to, to say to Devin, <laughs> you're a complete freaking maniacal idiot if you turn down the opportunity to have RC bray. <laughs> nicely worded yes and i'm glad i took that advice <laughs> well, you know, I was trying not to be too directive, but it's just so such a one-sided issue in my mind. I think he has some concerns about the accent, and that's perfectly reasonable. But the thing is, is Bray is wildly talented, and he's even more popular than that. And lucking into him was just about the best thing that's happened in my writing career. He's also a super, super nice guy. But people just love him, you know, and they'll read anything he narrates. And so, yeah. right, but uh, luckily, um, in the end, uh, Devin won right this time. I, I, I do think about it. On, the, on Arisen, um, I'm, I'm up to date um, with all the audibles. Um, now, I'll, I'll be honest, I can't bring myself to buy the actual books of yeah. your latest ones because I, I, can't, I can't dilute that, that Bob Ray series. If I read <laughs> the last two, I, it, they, they'll be completely different books in my head. So I'm actually, what I've started doing, I've started from book one again this morning on Audible, and I'm going right back through hoping that, by the time the next one's out on Audible, I would have caught up by then. But on that, roughly how many emails or messages do you get a day asking when the next Audible is out? A hundred thousand billion. <laughs> <laughs> Plus or minus five. The yeah. The audiobook is so fanatical. And Devin, thanks. You know, it's a real compliment. I didn't, I didn't that you read the series at all or listened to it rather. Oh, no, I love them. Absolutely love the original series. It's and, and the re-readers and real things are a real compliment because I don't think everything stands up to re -reading. So whenever anyone says they did that, I'm just knocked out and really humbled and flattered. But um, yeah, the, the, the audiobook guys are kind of kind of rabid, you know. And so they have this, uh, the idea was this time, you know, I actually kept them posted. I don't write to a deadline because the book's done when it's done. The, the irony is that I always hit what I anticipate is going to be my deadline, but I won't commit to it because the book's not done until it's done. And, and this occasion, I kept Podium Publishing surprised of my every move so that they could try to schedule R RC Bray, who's really hard to schedule, work out. So there's going to be another six month delay between when I got the book out and when they get the audiobook out. And I was afraid for my life to go back to the audiobook listeners and tell them this. <laughs> in, that, in that case, I'm sorry, because I, I managed to jump the queue on you there with my last, uh, my next audible. So uh, sorry about that. <laughs> I really want to finish your series, but he's got to do mine first. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. To be fair, well, that's probably one of the only reasons I will wait. Yeah, exactly. Well, there are a lot of guys out there who, and it's a great compliment, who are like, I got to find out what happens, but I don't want to, you know, jump out of hearing Bray narrate it. But anyway, you know, I, I genuinely, I, and I told the podium, I was like, I'm afraid to tell them this. I can't go back to them and tell them six months. It's going to be horrific. And uh, I'm like, well, I don't want to tell you. So I, I wrote this long message stressing that it's nothing to do with me. I don't, I have no control over this. And uh, I'm so sorry. And, and please leave me the hell out of it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I did see that. <laughs> we're, we're huge audiobook fans here on the show. We're all really into them and stuff. And uh, <clears throat> there's several series that are, are just like that where you get into after several books. But I find that 
like with certain authors, when I read their eBooks or whatever, I'll hear that narrator still in my head because yeah. I've listened to, you know, hundreds yeah. of hours of this person talking, which is a little bit psychotic, but you know, <laughs> but I enjoy it. So I have the same thing. I am um, one of the joys of my work is that I get to make up whatever chapter title I want. And I can be <laughs> how's profanity on this program, by the way, I have no idea. Oh, you just do what Go you for you. <laughs> so, so Oh, we were loving I, some of your titles, so we'd like to talk about those anyway. <laughs> yeah, chapter titles are a blast. You can call whatever you want, and you just like amuse yourself. But now I cannot compose a chapter title without hearing it in the RC Brave voice. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the last cycle of the yeah. six months for him to pronounce the chapter title as follows. Holy fucking shit. Didn't <laughs> 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 disappoint. It had all expectations. You're not the you're not the only author to do that. I um I spoke with Craig Allenson, um the um Expedition Force writer, um and he's obviously got Bob Bray as well, and he actually wrote in a character just to hear, <laughs> he made her, her up, and it was not a disappointment. That's sweet. <laughs> That's devious right there. Every time I read, uh, I go back and either read Mistborn, like on my uh, on my Kindle, uh, I always hear Michael Kramer reading it and. <clears throat> so like I read it and sometimes I'm like I need to read faster, but I'm like Michael Kramer doesn't read that fast. I have to slow down. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, you guys, I had actually um I'd, this is really a confession. I'd never really listened to an audiobook before I was proofing my own audiobooks and even more horrendously, I'd I'd probably never read a zombie book before I started writing zombie books. <laughs> nice. But so I wasn't, you know, like I did a few things that I would have done differently if I'd been thought thinking about poor Bob is what you know all the insiders call him Bob Ray. But I've been thinking about poor Bob, and I specifically had one scene set in uh, the op center, I guess, uh, or briefing room of a nuclear super carrier, and there were like eight or ten or twelve guys around the table, and like four or six of them were all these hard ass special operations NCOs, you know, like these big gruff guys, and somehow poor Bob had to differentiate all those voices as they went back and forth for like. <laughs> Right. You had to give him a tick. Well, That's I wrote it to apologize. I'm like, I'm so sorry I did that to you, but he pulled it off with perfect aplomb. If I ever got uh, like R.C. Bray or, or Luke Daniels or somebody like that to read a book, I'd, I'd purposely put it a scene where like we've got one Australian, we've got like one Irish dude. <laughs> we have <laughs> pick an accent. Uh, South African. Dark South African. We've got some Korean dude in the back and like just have a and have very small dialogue tags. So he's just like, rah, rah, rah to do it on purpose just yeah don't so, so, that's a breakdown that's going to put mine and michael's schedules really far behind <laughs> <laughs> josh is yeah you have to wait and get mine uh my plan to destroy the universe is starting off well uh, so let's it's talk about Arisen for a little bit and uh, the ideas behind the books. And then uh, from what I can see, it, it, it started out or it may still be a, a, co a collaboration project with uh, Glenn James. So can you talk about that and, and a little bit about the project? Yeah, sure. It was all his idea. You know, he came to me with it. And um, I, I'm aware of repeating myself in multiple interviews. I don't want to bore people. But he, he essentially said, you know, I've got this idea for a co-written series that would, you know, involve your over-the-top action and military stuff and my horror, creepy, reflective stuff. And, and so my initial reaction was, no. And I thought, <laughs> thought about it for five seconds. I said, yeah, why the hell not? And so we, we co-wrote the first half of the series, I guess. And um, then he bowed out to... Um, work on his other series and meet other obligations and pursue other projects. And, and um, I was lucky enough to sort of inherit it and took off with it. And, you know, working with it was great and there'd be no reason without Glenn. And um, um, the, the creative interchange was fantastic at the time. Uh, country wise, having full creative control now, it has its charms as well. We talk a lot about collaboration on this show. Uh, I think most of us have tried it to some extent. Um, I haven't, not yet. Okay. Me neither. Am I the only one who hasn't yet? Okay, uh, so I half have. of us, fifty percent exactly. I wouldn't inflict myself on anyone like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. Um, it's like anything you do. You know, it's like everything in life. You know, there's um, rewarding stuff is challenging. So there is challenging interpersonal stuff, and your egos are a little caught up in it, and so you have to sublimate that and and constantly be aware that the only thing that's important is the quality of the work. Um, and you know the feelings of the other guy, but you can't make your make it about your own feelings or your own preciousness. Um, and if you can get past that, you know, then there's some amazing rewards because creativ creativity, you know, in a collaborative environment, you know, it sparks and it's richer and it's and it's deeper. I think a lot about the, the television writers' rooms in Hollywood, and I really envy those guys sitting in a room all day long with eight super smart, super creative, super successful writers, just breaking story. 
And um, I got to do a little of that, and that was pretty good. So um, with when he, when he came to you with the, the project, um, what was it that you guys wanted to do with it? And, and have have you envisioned that through your – I mean, it's 14 books, right? So uh, is the, the series 16. kind of – 16, sorry. Uh, there's there's the, an 0.5, and there's a standalone as well, if I'm right. Not that yeah, I'm a fan of the series or anything. <laughs> <laughs> They're both, uh, they're both technically prequels and, and in theory also standalone, but then they have some material that feeds into the main series. Yeah, what do we want to do? I mean, the nice thing about sort of an end of the world um, story is you can, you know how it ends. Either the world's saved or the world's doomed. So we'd get to that point, we'd be done. Um, we didn't, um, I don't think we envisioned it going quite so long. And in fact, if I had to do it over again, I would have tightened up a couple of books, which were ar arguably a little superfluous, or at least not focus enough on driving the story forward. But um, we had some idea what we wanted to do, and um, in some ways we made it up as we went along, and it, and it got really deep and rich, and you know, before long we had 500 named characters and dozens and dozens of storylines all converging and spanning the globe. And he said, in fact, Glenn pointed said that at the beginning, he said, you know, there's never been, to the best of his knowledge, a zombie apocalypse epic. And so that was kind of the ambition, and weirdly, I'm actually looking at, um, I just got the proof paperbacks today. Props. Uh, the last two props, like yeah. props. Well, look at the thickness of this. Band. Oh my gosh! Jeez. Holy cow! That's a monster. What kind of work counts on that? I've got to take these tromping around the jungles of Colombia starting on Thursday. I'm not looking forward to that. But, <laughs> but anyway, somebody, you know what? I bet you could kill a spider with one of those books. Those are pretty solid. <laughs> camel spider. Probably not a camel spider, no. No? no, definitely not a camel spider. So you mentioned earlier that um, you didn't read a lot of zombie books before you got started or, or, or none. However, but uh, so do you guys talk when you got started about these are the rules for our zombies? This is what causes Ooh. zombies. Um, like some world building type things. A lot of times our, our, our listeners are interested in that type of stuff. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, that's interesting stuff. Um, Glenn was, was on that, and we, we kind of hit the ground running as if we knew what we were doing. So the, in the canon, you know, they're the slow-moving Romero-type canonical zombies. And then yeah, and then post-28 days later, they're the serious shit, fast-moving, chaser-ass zombies. And so we're like, what, what can we do that would be new? What, what's worse than fast zombies? So um, it's not actually, it doesn't sound that creative when I put it this way, but we came up with really fast zombies. <laughs> <laughs> really? No, I'm serious, man. <laughs> Curious <laughs> zombies. The genetic tag was, was great because you've got your Zulus, you've got your Romeos, for your, your zombies and your runners. Then you've got your Foxtrot Novembers, um, which, you, well, you'll beat me out of fucking nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't get the November part. Yeah, I was trying to place it too. I was like, all right, that makes sense. That makes sense. But are I they love... faster or slower than the spiders that are obviously have to be in this story? No, they're not as quick as the spiders behind Josh. No. I love that he's really, he, like, he prefaced. He was like getting ready to say it, and then as he was getting ready to say it, he processed it like, "Ah, oh, it doesn't sound really creative now," and I'm going to say it. Uh, really, that's like everything, though. That's like that's like when you have that dream and you wake up and you're looking for something to write down the story idea on. You're like, "This is the best idea ever." And it's three in the morning, then you read it like six hours later, and you're like, "That was not that interesting at all." I woke up for that. You can allow me to save my own ass by drawing down a little bit. So, so they are really fast, but they're manic and they can jump pretty significant distances and up onto things. And moreover, they don't feed, they don't eat people, they just go around infecting, they scratch and bite and run. Makes sense. So, yeah, so the idea is it's a mutation of the zombie virus to get into the very last pockets of the living once the almost the whole world is overrun. So we started with a ticking clock, and then this is literally in the first chapter of the first book, that the clock got massively accelerated, and we're like, okay, now we're really screwed. And whatever it is we're gonna do to save the world, we better do it really quickly. So. so um, with a lot, of, a lot of zombie stories, the origin of the zombie virus is is uh, not known, or that's that's kind of like the the driving force in in a book to figure out what caused it, so we can save them. And uh, yeah. do we know what caused the the zombie apocalypse, or is it just one of those things that is overhanging, and we focus on what the characters do to overcome it, kind of like uh, Walking Dead, or or is it is the, uh, the yeah, it's the latter. We um, it's a good question, and it definitely drilled down. We we started it without any particular explanation, and then after the first two books, which we wrote together, um, it's not that interesting that we were taking an authorial break. But I went back and I wrote this prequel called Arisen Genesis, and it drills right down in the century, if I can even remember this, because my it's sort of I've been immersed in this every second, certainly for a year, and most every second for for six years, 
and now I'm sort of thinking about other things, but essentially it was a, a attempted bioweapons attack by Al-Shabaab, the um, uh, Al-Qaeda offshoot in Somalia in Eastern Africa. And so they buy a chimera virus manufactured by a disaffected, rather interesting Kazakh bioweaponeer who used to work for the Soviet bioweapons program. So the, the virus was initially a I hope this is interesting. It was a chimera of smallpox and myelin toxin, which is kind of a nerve agent. And then the, the Al Shabab guys fuck the whole thing up, and it gets um, <laughs> it gets essentially loose. Uh, an, an elite, you know, tier one American special operations unit goes in to kill the bioweaponeer, kill the the Al Shabab guys, destroy the weapon stocks, and they do, except for one little bit that they had tested on a baboon out in the the bush of eastern Somalia. And so some rabbit dogs find it and kill the baboon and the guy who was looking over them. And so the virus mutates in the presence of rabies. And so these three different pathogens combine to something that looks quite like zombies. And so I did a ton of like, um, you know, bioweapons research and- um, but just, yeah, You can't get away with Googling that too much, can you? Right. <laughs> <laughs> you can, but you have to answer questions. Well, I got a couple of good books on the shelf. And there was one that's a little hard to find actually written by a guy who was a defector, a Soviet defector, and he worked as a higher up in what was called Biopreparat, the Soviet by the secret, super secret by Soviet Bible weapons program for decades. And he made all this shit and it was seriously nasty stuff. Um, so there's a fun amount of research. It's made me really uh, I use a lot of hand sanitizer, let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> that that kind of does bring up a side point. Earlier in the show, we've got a lot of comments on your bookshelf. So just not really a question, but people are like, we love his bookshelf. So uh, who am I? Yeah. 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 Oh, thanks. Yeah, me too. I don't know if it's on to move the camera, but essentially in the middle, there, that's the very middle. nice. Yeah. That's probably like 300 volumes of military memoir, military history, military nonfiction. I got like multiple aircraft carrier books. And that's how I learned to write military fiction. And then down here is sort of the um, storycraft stuff um, playwriting, screenwriting, dramaturgy, novel writing, and then that's the. Uh, we're planning an award show at some point, and if we have one on best bookshelf, I think you pretty much got that, that <laughs> very, very wrapped up. That's pretty <laughs> that's, that's intense. Bookshelf most likely to intrigue the FBI. <laughs> <laughs> most know, likely to be seized in a federal raid. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> you know, but before I had arisen, I wrote another, um, have another series. It's sort of a more straight <clears throat> special operations military adventure series. And so I wrote this really big, really hard book called Counter Assault, which was essentially about um, an attempt by, it was a former um, unit guy, former Gulf Force guy who defects and goes and works with the mullahs in Iran, and he's going to do an EMP attack on Israel to bring on the state of Israel. And so there are nuclear subs, you know, and there's all these, you know, nerve. Anyway, I realized my search history was a fucking nightmare. You know, like if anybody saw my search history, they would assume I'm planning something absolutely horrendous. <laughs> you know, and so when I looked at it, I actually published it. I was like, okay, you got to see this because it's all about, well, you can imagine. And so if, you have, if the NSA was monitoring that, I would not have been the least bit surprised if getting rock on the door. They probably use you as some sort of benchmark. It's like anybody that does more than this, we need to be watching. <laughs> so I had a question earlier about, because you mentioned that you've been doing this for five years. You obviously do a massive amount of research, um, which is awesome. So I guess two questions. Are you a fast reader? And how do you stay focused on one project for so long? Or do you do other things on the side? No, I am not a fast, not particularly fast reader. Um, uh, the research is sort of ongoing. Like I love to read um, you know, military memoirs. Or my, it's, it's not a coincidence that you know, I read the kind of things I do because I find, particularly in the special operations world, you know, I'm amazed we have these ridiculous superhero movies because we have real life superheroes walking around. And so people know that, you know, uh, Special operations guys, you know, supreme commandos that they move and shoot and communicate with enormous skill and efficiency. But, but you know, they can hack computer networks. They got political skills. They can, you know, hey ho jump from forty thousand feet with scuba gear. And um, is, you know, the, I'm, I'm interested in the theme of um, uh, human, the perfectibility of humankind. Right? And these guys yeah. are that. So I read about this stuff obsessively anyway. Um, as to sort of answer your question, how do I stay focused? I do take, um, I inevitably take a break between writing each cycle material, and right. I'll go take a track somewhere remote. Um, I'll try to read some non-work related books, although that doesn't really work real well. Do you write anything else like uh, side series or short stories, or are you just you staying on the, on the on track for the series that's your main focus? Yeah, I've been on a mission, you know, and I, I alluded to this, but after the second book, 
when we, you know, got the first cycle out, I was like, well, I'm going to go do something with my main series. I'm going to write another D-Boys book, which was the name of my other series. And, and my response to him, which I say to you now, is, no, I'm all in on a risen date. You know, like, I knew we had something. And yeah. so I've just been pushing nonstop. That's smart. That's smart. And, but easier said than done sometimes. I mean, for me personally, uh, and I know that the other guy's got a few questions from the from the uh, from our live chat. But for me personally, I when I face writer's block, the most common thing is that I will write a different project. Yeah, I know other people do that too. I think, I think that's impressive. Yeah, if you can do that, that shows you know real commitment to your craft. And, but um, sticking on task is so much harder. But probably would be would be the right way a lot of times, especially if you got something that's really important. Like you're doing. I, think, I think that's good. I wish I could do that. In fact, with book five, um, which many people think is, is one of the better books in the series, it's this giant set piece battle where a nuclear supercarrier is beached off the coast of Virginia and a storm of 10 million dead is approaching and they can't get away. And that's so awesome. Absolutely gigantic and really complex set piece battle. And it nearly defeated me. I didn't think I could write it. And as I tried to story design this thing, I was like, this is beyond my powers as a storyteller. As a story designer, as an author, I'm defeated. You know, like, and so like one of the suggestions was, one was like, well, either let's go write something else and clear our heads, or let's just you know wind this whole thing down because <laughs> we can't. <laughs> um, and luckily, I, I you know, and, and I took the lessons from the special operators again. You know, their watchwords are resilience and resolve. You know, sure. resilience all difficulties, resolve to accomplish the mission no matter what. So I dug down and I, I recommitted. I said, I'm going to write this book if I have to do it five words at a time. You know, and once I committed to that level, it got a little bit easier. Some of the, the problems started to look like opportunities, and it started to come together, and you just have to you know, say, okay, this is what I'm doing. But again, you know, I wish I could have gone off and done something else. But I, that, that's very well said, and I think that will yeah. be useful to a lot, of our, a lot of our listeners. So I do thank you for that. I've got, I've got to say, that, that battle on the supercarrier, for those not familiar with the story, you've got a billion-strong wave of undead heading for a beached um, nuclear supercarrier, and that brought out the ten-year-old boy in me like you would not believe. Not <laughs> only are they using the close-in weapon system, the anti uh, anti-ballistic missile systems of a supercarrier, depressed barrels, and taking out armies of dead. They've got special operations of people landing through parachute in the dark on deck whilst this is happening. I was, I was almost bouncing as I, as I was listening to this. <laughs> I'm about to read the whole you, series. You nailed, that, you nailed that battle. That's, that's awesome. Hey, thanks, man. I appreciate it. So I want to kind of get into a little bit of the, uh, the mechanical aspect of how you do that. Uh, I've got a couple questions, and then Chuck also has some questions from the audience, but I want to do our uh, um, episode sponsor here really quick before we move into that uh, section of the interview. Uh, this episode is sponsored by me. So uh, uh, Rich, <laughs> Richard Fox and I uh, released last week our first uh, collaborative book, Terra Nova, based on his uh, Ember War series. Um, it's a spinoff and uh, in a completely different galaxy, uh, but Ken Hale makes a, a reappearance and we have a new character, um, Kit Carson, Catherine Carson. And uh, so I'll read you the blurb. Uh, Terra Nova, the promised world, is humanity's new home, safe from the threats of a dangerous galaxy where veterans of a long war could live in peace. That promise was a lie. Chief Catherine Kit Carson of the Elite Pathfinder Corps joins the mission last minute as a last minute replacement, hoping to put a spotty background behind her and build a new life on a brave new world. The expedition arrives on Terra Nova, expecting to join the first wave of colonists. Instead, they find abandoned cities and are soon faced with a new terrifying enemy humanity has never encountered before. For the colony to survive, Carson must unravel the mystery of her new home and learn the fate of the first mission to settle the planet uh, that was released on Tuesday. We've already got a couple of cool reviews. Um, I will post the link in the live chat and uh, it will be in the show notes. Obviously uh, go buy my book right now. Good and, candidate uh, for an audio book. I'm just saying uh, it is a fantastic <laughs> for an audio book. Um, it'll be great. I, I know something that I'm not allowed to more, do. more news on that later. And, uh, <laughs> uh, so That's good. I want to read that. Uh, I think you should have used your voiceover voice to uh, to read that though. Terra Nova, the promised world is humanity's <laughs> new home. <laughs> there you go. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do that for the next ad read, and I'm not even gonna yeah. tell anybody. I'm just doing it. Just break it out. So that's the ad read, and and uh, so Chuck, do you want to hit that first question? And yeah, then... uh, actually, Vicky Malone Kennedy had two questions, and I'm gonna kind of mash them together. The first 
part is, did you guys start out with a story arc for 16 books or did you kind of add to them as they succeeded? And we've established that you're not a very fast reader. How fast a writer are you? What's your daily output like? <laughs> These are good. Five questions. words at a time. <laughs> yeah, good questions and thank you very much. Um, no, we definitely did not start out with um, a framework for 16 books. I think if we had been guessing, we would have said maybe eight at the time, and it just grew. Um, story design is always a fractal process, so you have some scaffolding. You know, you have some idea of what the shape is going to look like, and as you get into it, you know, you drill down and and you learn that there are more detailed questions that you need to answer, and you push forward. So um, I think it was Elmore Leonard actually who said. Writing a novel is like driving cross country at night. You can only see 50 feet in front of you in the headlights, but you can get to your destination that way. Um, yeah. So um, now, and then the other answer to that is that I do more story design before every book I write. And I've realized that the writing is easy, it's storytelling that's hard. And so um, I have a huge story design process now. So before I write a word, I definitely know what's gonna happen in every book down to a pretty granular level. I've, you know, I use uh, Scrivener, which is a popular. Like, Yay, oh, oh. Awesome. You just oh, yeah. the question there. <laughs> That's one of our questions we always ask later. Anyway. <laughs> a, there's just no, there's no substitute for it. And B, it's infinitely powerful. The, the better you know how to use it, uh, the, the more you learn about it, the more that's rewarded. And you can never get to the bottom. There's always more functions that, that are helpful. Um, anyway, so I have this ridiculous, you know, project document at this point with literally thousands of documents and hundreds of beat cards and note cards and um, outlines and, <clears throat> and and that's it. Even doing all that, of course, it's still fractal, which is you sit down to the day's writing and you still find questions that you didn't know to ask when you're doing the design. And for the second part of the question, um, I'm told, um, it, well, everyone has standards. I feel pretty prolific. Um, for me. Um, I can live with myself on it. when I'm writing. I'm writing, you know, like I'm really focused and I'm, I'm producing and I drive forward. I don't, you know, I don't think about as I see written. But for me, 3,000 words, I can live with myself. 4,000 is solid. 5,000 is great. Um, on this last cycle, when I was just going bed to desk for 100 days and just in complete isolation and grinding, um, I actually hit my all time record, which was 1,070. I had 8,000 word day, 8,072. Wow. And that's typing nice. or dictating or something else? I type, yeah, I type. I um, the other part of my writing day is the note taking. I, <clears throat> the, well, I'm rambling, but another key component of my writing day is my running. I run 10k a day, and I have to for a variety of reasons. But particularly when I'm writing, because that's when I do all the creative work. So I'm this maniac running through London's Royal Parks, whispering really into my you know MP3 player slash voice recorder, and I look extremely dodgy doing that. <laughs> <laughs> like a secret agent. Secret agent. Well, yeah. Particularly by running by some embassy, you know, some of London's embassies. It's not. Right. Um, Taking pictures, too. That obviously makes you. Keep keeping security. your wrist. Right. Just talk to yeah. you. Right. And then so you're like, the isn't that the guy that's on the list for Googling how to blow up embassies <laughs> right there? <laughs> that's weird. <laughs> they connect the dots, so I'm done for. Um, <laughs> to be fair, I think a lot of us are on some kind of watch list with the things we research. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the FBI watches this show. Just <laughs> <laughs> Well, at least I could repost it for you. Right. I mean, yeah. share, share alike, man. At least buy the book. I mean, it's going to be research. You know, they should the whole it. FBI to buy Terra Nova. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so one of the questions I have that uh, continues with uh, your writing process is uh, I have two questions. The first one I have, uh, and then we can kind of get into the second part of the question, is you talk about the fractal process and you talk about planning your entire sure, novel. Right. So I'd like to dial that down into a specific scene just to give us a, a picture of how you develop your, your story design. So say you start out with a scene and you've got an idea for that scene in your head. How does that progress to the paper? What, what steps do you go through to get a narrative complete scene? Yeah, um, like in terms of the physical yeah. design. Okay, so I'm in Scrivener and I've got great piles of notes that have piled up over the course of you know, the writing the last book and the time in between. And some of those will slot into specific, um, you know, chapters or acts. Um, everything's three act based, um, but they're kind of jumbled, right? So as I go through those, I start to flesh it out and try to develop better ideas. Ultimately what it becomes, lately I'll do an outlining process just because it's, you can get it in front of you. And it might be a really long, really complex fleshed out, uh, fleshed out outline with a lot of subheaders, but it's a little more um, tractable and manageable than the real deliverable that comes after that, which is the beat cards. So organized by book and act, I, I beat out essentially every beat. And a beat is a story element, a story action, something happening, a value change. 
So there'll be dozens and dozens and dozens of labeled ink cards, and each one has, you know, in Scrivener, you view it as a note card view, right? So you've got a title for right. it, it's a very short version of what happens, and then you've got the card itself, which will give you like sort of the six or eight line version of what happens, and then attached to that is a note section with all of the material relevant to that beat, ideally in some kind of order. Um, and then you look at the beat cards, and, and I write from that essentially. That's uh, that's basically essentially how I do it as well. Oh right. And uh, I, although I, I um, when I do when I do my outlines, I, I um, I have a, a separate folder for the outline beats where I can start at the note cards and go to the cork board and just do all the scenes that I need and then rearrange in the beat folder, and then I, <clears throat> so I like to track all my words. So for my my beats when I generate them, I type have that folder in the manuscript compile so it'll show me how many words i have <clears throat> and then when i go to actually write the draft i create another draft folder <clears throat> and then put the beats next to the empty page and then copy off the beats onto a different folder so it's i'm always tracking the productive words that's interesting um that sounds really good i'm glad it's not just me who's sort of um <clears throat> beat sheet focused it's more um, people think more of the screenwriters, of course, for that kind of thing. But think, right. One of the things with Scrivener yeah. that's nice is if you have a longer series, if you, I've started. Josh kind of taught me everything I know about Scrivener, but one of the things I've done, I put a whole series in one Scrivener document, and then I can open it all, and like I can search for a name, or mm -hmm. if you have like if you have something that you think is going to be an inconsistency issue with a name or eye color or something, you can search for things through the entire series, not just the one book. You know, nice. um, that can be that can be very useful if you're looking looking for a detail you can't remember from book one you can just search for it and just find it in two seconds rather yeah. than rereading the entire book <laughs> a lot that's really so, good so the second question i had that, that goes into your design process you mentioned when you were talking about this beached aircraft carrier scene and it was it was a uh, uh, I can't remember the words you used, but you, you basically described it as very a very hard scene to write. Um, when you sat down and you had, okay, I'm going to have all these zombies attacking this ship. <clears throat> when you go to design that scene, how do you see that mentally? Do you draw it out on a piece of paper or do you, do you in your head, do you say this is here and this is here and this is what's going on? How do you uh, design that scene? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Because, um, because mm -hmm. it's military fiction, and because the watchword of this series and all the stuff I write is, I hope, uh, military realism. So tactics, techniques, procedures, weapons, um, strategy, um, you know, close quarters battle stuff, um, all of it, I hope, is really spot on. So I, what I end up doing is not so much story design a lot of the time as um, tactical design. And it does become very spatial and visual and where is everyone <clears throat> and what are the lines of fire. And so sometimes you'll plan these set piece battles and it really is a bit like planning an actual invasion. You know, you get actions on and time on target and <laughs> run, right. rendezvous and rally points and contingencies. And um, so, yeah, if you need to like uh, fight a uh, 10 million zombie on aircraft uh, battle, I can you know, help you out. But, yeah, you can coach us through it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do a lot of drawing. It's been suggested before. I could do a little bit more. A lot of it is in my head, but but you know, I, I occasionally, you know, like if there's a complex or a series of structures, I might scribble out where they are. And it's fun, you know. Like this is a bit of a digression, but I love the writing superpowers of always being able to go back. You know, so like I wrote the other standalone is called Arisen Nemesis, and um, so they there's a giant set piece battle where they attack a fortress out in the wilds of Somalia. That's like Al Shabaab's last stronghold in the zombie apocalypse, and so it's basically half of the Special Forces ADA and trying to take on about 300 guys while a giant zombie herd is coming in. <laughs> <laughs> and so this has to be planned out very carefully. And they drive in the front gates and two very up armored Special Forces gun trucks. And then all this stuff happens for them to try to rescue their captured teammate. And again, a bit of a digression, but maybe worthwhile. So one guy, you know, parks his gun truck up, up between a couple of buildings and he's, you know, rocking the minigun, trying to keep the guys on the ramparts trimmed down. And then and I'm actually looking at it mentally and in the drawings, and I'm like, he's got to he's got to destroy this guard tower, but he can't, or he's got to know that this guy's in this guard tower, but he can't possibly see it from that sideline, or it'll screw up a bunch of other stuff. I was like, I know, tactical quadcopter. So I went back five chapters again. <laughs> <laughs> and battlefield quadcopters. It's, and suddenly you can see everything you do to it. Like, that is awesome. I love solving problems like that. Yeah, right. That's the fun part, right? The puzzle solving. Yeah. Fantastic. I've got to ask Michael, have you have you always been like that? Have you always been a planner? You've never just sat down and just seen where it takes you? 
oh no well like you know i am um, my first novel jesus christ i uh, took two years to write and four years to fix because it was such a complete disaster right? <laughs> <laughs> we're all laughing because we've all been through that yeah that right process. yeah the, the more you become a craftsman um you know um the more you um you, know, you develop your tools and you have some idea what you're doing and you, and you plan more and more so you're yeah, winging it. And in fact, I remember very fondly writing that, the process of writing that first novel because it was so damn much fun. I would just, you know, have a couple of beers, put on some raucous music, some tool, you know, low light, and just write these action scenes. And then at the end, I had all these great action scenes that did not cohere into anything. <laughs> 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 so that actually goes into my next question. What's a, so you're a full-time writer and uh, you, you aim for three or four or 5,000 words a day. Can you kind of walk us through what a normal the day is from you from waking up to writing your words. Yeah, where's the five k yeah. go? I'm I'm skeptical that this is very interesting, but I'm happy to do it. So maybe oh I'll no, we it. love this stuff. All right, I'll keep it. So wake, coffee, right? Like I when I'm writing, I stay out of messaging or email until the writing day is done because you just so easy to get sidetracked. So I do nothing. Get up, coffee. Did I mention coffee? Because coffee. <laughs> coffee. <laughs> coffee. I've got a coffee maker right here if you need some. <laughs> Always. Yeah. So I sit down and I review the prior day's material and I basically do an editing pass of whatever I produced yesterday. And that gives me a, an editing, editing pass to clean it up a little bit, but mainly it gets my head back in the book. I know right where I am. Then I dress out, stretch, go for the run. All the ideas come. I record 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 voice notes on a bad day. Come back, shower, sit down, transcribe all the voice notes. I got asked last time, do you use transcription software? And the answer is no. I experimented with it, but I, you know, it, it's a pain in the ass to transcribe by hand, but it forces me to engage with the material and get them slotted into the right notes documents. Um, and more coffee or tea. Um, and I settle down for the afternoon writing session. And um, I go by word count, not by time. Um, so I watch the word count, and when I get to you know, 4,000, I feel pretty good about myself and you know, find a stopping point. I don't agree with, I think it was Hemingway who said always, you know, stop right before the end of the chapter so you can slide on in the next day with some momentum. I don't cleave to that. I, you know, what feels like a stopping point is a stopping point. And then I collapse and I make a huge smoothie and I sit in the couch with my book and that's it. How long does it typically take you to get to 4,000? Yeah, um, I'm not even sure. It's funny, it's a funny fact, uh, I'm sure you've seen this, but if you go around the world and you ask <clears throat> every every writer in the world, all works three to five hours a day. It's almost universal. Every right. <laughs> yeah. Three to four five hours a day. I think yeah, there's some science behind that. Yeah. Is there? I, I've read, I was reading a book, and I, I think it's called The One, it's either The One Thing or it might be one of the sleep books I've read, but it talks about that you have most people have about four hours of quality focus time whether you're a scientist or a creative person wow. and that's really kind of the upper limit of what you can do and that's why you shouldn't ruin those four hours with you know mindless social media or something that's genius and that doesn't surprise me at all and um yeah it's uh, of course your head's in the book all day long right so you're living with it constantly mm -hmm. but yeah three four five hours and then this last cycle finishing the series was an outlier for me it was an absolute death march and i just had to get out from under it and get to the end. so i was doing like seven or eight hours in the chair um wow unusual and not sustainable was that just so that the audible fans didn't find out where you lived and killed you <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was again I, I had to get out from under it the um Writing books 11 and 12 was really, at the time, was the hardest thing I'd ever done. It ended up being really, really complex to make it all click. And and I didn't think anything could get harder. And it was just a failure of imagination on my part. So as I said, you know, never again with the epics. 500 named characters. There were probably 20, 25 important characters whose juries had to resolve. Um, there were dozens of storylines that had to come together. Obviously, there had to be a conclusion that was, as Aristotle says, surprising yet inevitable. Um, it had to do justice to everything that came before. It had to pay off dozens of setups that had come through 15 prior books and so this all sounds very exalted. Suffice to say it was a huge pain in the ass and it made my brain hurt every day, all day long. <laughs> <laughs> and I just had to make the pain stop. And so, <clears throat> yeah, so I was about, I think I was about book six or seven in and I was asked, oh, what are you listening to? And started to explain it. Um, and then they started looking at their watch and then I, then I made a small <laughs> PowerPoint presentation um, pointed out with graphics uh, who was where, uh, pointing out there, was, there, was, there were things happening at four, uh, four different places in the world simultaneously. And they go, well, hang on, well, I thought they were Russian. Oh, no, no, they're, they're a Brit with the American team. And this guy just gave up and walked away. So <laughs> it's fairly, it fairly involved. I said that was only halfway through. It's an arisen thing you wouldn't understand. Right. Yeah. Oh, it's it's all canon. You have to know it. 
<laughs> so with this series, and I think you mentioned that uh, it's wrapped up now or that you're finishing, do you, what are your plans uh, going forward? Do you have another series in mind? And you say you're not going to do another epic. So uh, are you going to continue in this genre or do you have ideas to go somewhere else? Yeah, the, um, the, the boring and uncreative and unsatisfying answer to what's after Arisen is more Arisen. Um, I've got... <laughs> There's an endless scope for prequels and side books and spinoffs, and and uh, it sounds crass and commercial and it is to extent. But if you get a franchise, a series that actually hits, it's kind of madness to walk the land. Sure. I was I was going to like Arthur Conan Doyle. I didn't say okay, enough with the Sherlock stuff. I'm gonna have a new series. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Christmas. George Lucas. That's enough Star Wars. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, no, but for real, George, that's enough Star Wars. For, yeah, George. That's. <laughs> That's probably the good counterexample, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that actually is a good point because it, uh, you know, uh, with Amazon and the indie stuff, you, you get a series, and that's the that's the new uh, magic, right? Is you find a series, yeah. <clears throat> you find a series, and you stick with it. So I'm, I'm wondering on the production side with uh, Amazon's algorithms and different things, do you hold to this 30, 60, 90 day cliff, or are you consistent in your releases? And, and what's your schedule for that going forward? Well, for for just publishing your books, what, what do you yeah. what do you what's your your magic juju that you use? Like Richard, Fox, a, lot, a lot of people. Put I've got to have a book every thirty or sixty days. Right. So, what what what? It, how is your system when you work to publish? Yeah, I, think the, I think the linchpin was luck. You know, we were lucky enough to just build and grow an audience kind of out of nowhere. But um, the one thing that we've done and that I've stuck with is is you know, dual releases. So I write two books at a time. And as you guys will know, that has some you know, synergistic uh, benefit. The, the right. books. I haven't got the concentration to do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I do anymore. But, um, well, part of it was just I got sick of, you know, killing myself for five months and to produce, you know, something that's 125,000 words, you know, launch it literally 24 hours later, the readers are like, when's the next one? Oh, right. Uh, yeah. You yeah. want to say, well, here's the next one. Take that. All right, yeah, exactly. give me six months. It's just, it's just released. You breathe a sigh. It's a sigh of relief. You haven't turned the computer on. And when you do, you got eight emails saying, uh, I've finished it on Audible. When's it out next? Oh, right. Which, Which is, is a good a problem, problem to have. It's, it's a it is a good problem to have, but it's upsetting. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Just get to writing. So yeah. publishing two books at a time, what, what's, your, what's your turnaround on that? You, you, I mean, you write those same books uh, together and then you publish one and then the very same day you're publishing the second book? No, it's typically a three to four week gap. Um, what I do, it's very slightly staggered. I write them together and then I edit. I do sort of con consecutive editing passes, but then the first book goes off for proper editing and that's away. And then I spend time with the second book and then the first one comes back and then the second one goes away. Um, three weeks seems to be about the sweet spot, three or four weeks. But it's been, the run rate has been about three books a year for about five and a half years. Oh, very good. It's, it's really interesting talking to you about Arisen because... I, I see I see the series as so many plates all the way across the world spinning at the same time. I realize that's not the story. That's actually how your mind works. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, I think. It sounds like a nice compliment. <laughs> it, it is a backwards compliment. It sounded like an insult, potentially, but it wasn't. No, it's okay. There's, there's this wonderful phenomenon of the book being better than the author. And I love this concept because, you know, you spend months and months with it and the, the only advantage you have, writing a novel is like solving an equation in a billion variables. It's insoluble. You, you can't, there's no way to logically make it all fit together and result, because you, know, you move one thing and it throws everything else out of whack. But the one advantage you have is that over time, the book sloughs off uh, flaws and deficiencies and accumulates virtues, right? You get rid of the shit that doesn't work, keep the good stuff, and it builds up and it gets stronger. And you get to go back in time and fix something that was a complete wreck. And okay, now that makes sense. And so I think a lot of authors see this. You get a book and you're like, how the hell did I write that? Because it's a lot better than I am. And you just... <laughs> one, of the, one of the interesting things I, uh, I've learned about collaboration, and maybe you've seen this with the, your first collaborations on your the first part of the series, is I, I opened up Terra Nova and just started flipping through pages the other day. And I'm looking at it, I'm like, I kind of remember writing that, but did I write that or not? And then, uh, <laughs> and then I'm like, whatever, if it's good, I wrote it. Like, I'm cool with it. <laughs> Do we have time to talk about the, well, before the show, we talked about kind of the senior partner, I guess, concept in, in a writing collaborative. So sometimes you have somebody who's kind of more vested or whatever. Um, and how, do, how does that, or how do you decide on what the final draft is? Is you guys both sit down and agree which is the best version of the story or does somebody who's, who is like the sponsor of, or whoever, you know what I'm saying, I think. Is that a question about me and Glenn writing or 
Oh, just, yeah. I mean that you can go to that. I know Josh and I both talked about this privately about, about how that kind of works, but with yours, yeah, just talk about your experience, I guess. I'm blabbering. Sorry. No, no, fine. Um, yeah, it's a, that was a little more tense. Uh, I was, I'm very particular, I'm particular about language. And so I edited obsessively. And so unfortunately, Glenn would, we read a Google Docs and Glenn would go in and he would see this ocean of red ink, which was yeah. really, <laughs> a lot of little micro changes because I'm really particular. I won't put something out that, you know, one of the pros isn't ready for prime time. And, but he would see this ocean of red ink and feel like it was being rewritten to death. And he had a point, you know, and so we had to find, find a balance to make that work. Um, but ultimately, the other answer is that I had my characters and storylines and chapters, and he had his. And ultimately, each of us was sovereign in our own material. Cool. So for for a new reader like me, it's not uh, didn't jump on the bandwagon right at the beginning. And uh, I mean, this does sound very interesting to me, especially the uh, the the very cool military aspects of it, which I, I think are left out of a lot of books. Um, for for coming into the series, is this something where I need to go all the way to book one and start at book one to go through to get everything of the series, or is there any other entry points that I can start at, or is it just start at book one and go? Yeah, unfortunately for you and me, it is it is one long series arc. It's like jumping into Breaking Bad in season four. You might have some fun, but you'll have no idea what's going on. Right, <laughs> right. And that's the other reason I'm kind of excited about doing side books, aside from the fact that there'll be you know two or three orders of magnitude simpler to write and quicker. <laughs> Um, the the, the built-in audience for book 14, which I just published, to, to be even a potential reader of this book, you had to have read 13 prior books in a row, which kind of reduces the pool. <laughs> right. But those people are probably hardcore by the time to get to book 14. So They do, and that's the thing, but but you winnow your audience a little bit. So it grew, but, you know, it was like uh, Battlestar Galactica, you know, which I thought they reimagined that that was a great program, but it's, a, it's a viewership at the end was half what it was in the beginning because you could fall off, but you couldn't jump in. So you'd have no idea. Right. Because it was serial and not episodic, and that's what Arisen is. To answer your question slightly better, the, the two prequels, Arisen Genesis and Arisen Nemesis, stand alone pretty well. And that's a good little intro, and they do happen before the main timeline. But the 14 main series books are pretty sequential. Well, you, jump you in, mentioned... Jump. Yeah, go ahead, dude. No, pick up Nemesis or Genesis if you want to see if it, you know, maybe it's for you. Uh, I will. And I, I was going to mention that you, you mentioned uh, the readership uh the read through of your series is phenomenal. Like I'm just looking at the, just your Amazon page going from book one to book 14. And when you, when you see a typical series like this, you'll see like book one, 500 reviews. And then when you get to book two, it's got like a hundred and book three has got 50 and then so on. You see kind of a, a, a downturn in reviews uh, regularly, but with you, I mean, yes, there is a little bit of, of uh less reviews on book two but then it pick it actually picks back up book three four and five have uh and all of your books are above what 300 on average on on every single one of them so that the it's read to get rate is is phenomenal on your books I, so congratulations i don't know what you're doing you're doing something yeah. extremely well to get that much read through for a, through a 14 book series i think that's great Thanks a lot. Yeah, a lot of luck. It's good fortune. I don't think that the series even gets very good till about book four anyway. So if people hang in that long, I think we've got them. Typical <laughs> self-effacing author. Right. <laughs> this is crap. Uh, I, um, I, uh, I say I've, I've not read them. Um, I've listened to them all. And I, I, suppose I don't think I could go back and read them now because I think, it, as I said, it would dilute it. I um, It was at the time before Michael actually spoke about you know R.C. Bray and um, our, we have the same um, Audible publisher, and I was looking through at this R.C. Ray bloke, never heard of him before. Um, I had a copy of The Marsh and obviously read that. I thought, that's, that was that's pretty good. Way better than the film. But um, And then and I found this omnibus three-book series um, by another R.C. Ray one, picked it up. Um, and it was obviously the first three Arisen books. And... Um, was straight on to book four with my second credit of the month um and then had to buy more credits um <laughs> the next two books managed to get me through to when the next credits come so i, I ended up buying an extra two books each month because i was literally just i never get time to read for fun unless i'm on holiday but i've always got an audiobook going in the car or in the office or whatever um and i literally the uh, the only thing that stopped me putting down the series was when they ran out <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you find I mean I take the occasional break to listen to another one in between when it's a new release but um, I think people keep picking up because yes you can you can potentially drop in and out and have fun doing it but 
people who start from the beginning, they're faithful. They want to know where it's going, especially the way you built up towards the end. And don't spoil it. I really, I, I want to wait. Um, <laughs> the way the way you've built up, it's almost like it's almost like you've got a modern day Cold War um, bubbling amongst the end of the world zombie apocalypse, and people are desperate to know what happens next and how it's going to end. And I don't know how you've ended it. Again, don't say anything. Um, but when you do, I think you're going to have so many people all the world just, just literally finishing and going, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> See, now I need to know what I'm sorry yet. So. Well, that's oh, real quick, before we, uh, before we wrap up, I have to ask you about what might be my favorite new book title in history. <laughs> and that is, Don't Shoot Me in the Ass and Other Stories. <laughs> <laughs> What's that all about? <laughs> I am so glad you like that title because I love that title. I, I it was, <laughs> no one, no one buys, reads, or sells short fiction, so you know it was. Uh, it's my least loved book, but it was a labor of love. I wrote, um, I wrote that between my first and second novels. I like short fiction, and yeah. I was stupid enough to think that someone would publish it, and no one did, so I did. But um, yeah, I like the title, and um, you know, it's a lot of action and technology. And it was, I was in Silicon Valley back in the day. My day job was in IT, so bunch of that stuff but um i think i actually stole that from um, a lesser known movie that sam elliott was in when he delivers that line oh, really? i love you know, that that is great he's going up a stairwell he gives the gun to james woods and he says goes back and says don't you mean the ass <laughs> <laughs> that is you fantastic i that. love that yeah good stuff well uh we're coming to the end of the hour uh all, uh so uh everybody that was uh hanging out with us in the live chat today thanks for coming and hanging out with us we appreciate it uh devin michael thank you so much for coming on the show it's been a blast to have you guys on pleasure as always oh thanks guys it was a blast i really appreciate it uh next week on the 11th it'll just be uh the keystroke guys talking about keystroke things and the 18th we have uh, jamie glover on who's a great uh cover designer ralph kern uh has hired him to do some stuff and uh it'll be a fun show i think and then we're on to season three next year if you can um, believe it if you can believe three it whole seasons and we're gonna have some some cool new things started in season three i think uh everybody will enjoy and have a good time with so start talking about the award show that's right so uh and covers for a cure two cover for a cure number two so uh, everybody that hung out with us or listened into the feed, thank you very much. Come and hang out with us on the live show. Uh, you're missing out if you're not in the shenanigans in the chat. For uh, Scott Moon and Chuck Manley, I am Josh Hayes. We have been live with uh, Michael Fuchs and, <laughs> and Devin C. Ford. It wasn't as good as the first one. Uh, thank you guys for hanging out. Come back next time. We're going to talk about some reading. We're going to talk about some writing. And, of course, everything in between right here on Keystroke Medium. You guys have Bye, guys. Thanks. Monday. Thank you. See you. On to the post show.